Exploring the life of faith can be made possible in many different ways. God is revealed in Scripture, but God can also be found in the stories that Scripture inspires and the art that is created in response. Some of these stories are told on pages while others make their way to the screen. This summer, we're taking time to look for God and how God might be speaking to us in three different stories. In light of the remarkable national conversation on matters of race that has blossomed in response to a number of recent tragic deaths, including George Floyd in the Twin Cities, we've decided to frame this summer's movie series to expand our understanding of race and society and how the church is called to respond. Today, we're using the first of the three different movies to shape our worship together. The recently released Just Mercy is based on the true stories and memoir of Brian Stevenson. To give you a taste of the movie, let's take a moment to watch the trailer. Tell me everything that happened. The first time I visited death row, I wasn't expecting to meet somebody the same age as me. From a neighborhood just like ours. Could have been me, mama. But what you're doing is gonna make a lot of people upset. You always taught me to fight for the people who need the help most. Your life is still meaningful, and I'm gonna do everything possible to keep them from taking it. You don't know what you're into down here in Alabama when you're guilty from the moment you're born. God! Mr. McMillan. We done here. Mr. McMillan, please. I was just about to give up when I got a call from a Harvard lawyer looking to start a legal center for inmates on death row. I was in before he even offered me the job. You the lawyer? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for driving all the way out here. Most lawyers barely make time to call. I can't believe you talked to all my people and said you're going to fight for me. I did. That mean a lot. If you go digging in those wounds, you're going to be making a lot of people very unhappy. When people care about a thing that much, they'll do anything to get what they want. When I first learned about all this, it was like looking at a river full of drowning people and not having any way of helping them. You ain't quitting, is you? No, sir. Each of us is more than the worst thing that we've ever done. I know what it's like to be in the shadows. my dad. He did nothing wrong. It's never too late for justice. You're the only one kid enough to fight for me. If we can look at ourselves closely, we can change this world for the better. We all need grace. We all need mercy. Amen. I got my truth back. You gave that to me. And ain't nobody gonna take that from us. Here's what Brian Stevenson had to say about the significance of the timing of this film's release. This is a critical time in our nation's history. We've been so divided by the politics of fear and anger that it's easy to stop caring about the things we should care about. It's easy to tolerate things we shouldn't tolerate. And the way you combat that is to get people closer to inequality, to injustice, and to things that are unfair. And that's what story making can do. That's what films can do. He also says, I've loved the power of cinema to draw you into someone else's life, someone else's experience, and to open your eyes and your heart to things that you, that you need to see and feel. And that's what I'm hoping to have happen with this movie. Today, we're going to be drawn deeper into this story because just like with scripture, it's important to find ourselves woven into the narrative. This is the world God has placed us within. It's a world in which we are expected to be active participants and co-creators with God of a future that hopefully fulfills God's vision where all will know love, 
and all will thrive as a result. As we begin, I invite you to light a candle. Let the flame be a reminder that God's presence is with us no matter where you might be right now. Be comforted to know that this presence is rooted in love. We continue to include a celebration of Holy Communion within each of our recorded worship services. We hope that you will join us by bringing your own elements to this virtual table at which we gather. With your popcorn today, bring your bread, wine, crackers, and juice. Just bring what you have. Finally, let's give thanks that we continue to be the church scattered and there is nothing virtual about how connected we remain in this life of faith. So let's pray. In your story, God, justice and mercy are key elements of the world you have imagined for us. Open our eyes and our ears this day. Let the stories that Jesus shared with his followers find an echo in the stories now told by writers and filmmakers so that we might be drawn even more deeply into this life of faith. Be with us this day as as with your help, we may recognize and name those times in our own lives when a just mercy may be found. Amen. There's a wideness in God's mercy Like the wideness of the sea there is kindness in God's justice, which is more than liberty. There is no place where sorrows are more felt than up in heaven. There is no place where earth's failings have such kindly judgment given. There is welcome for the sinner, and a promised grace made good. There is mercy with the Savior, there is healing in His blood. There is grace enough for thousands, of new worlds as great as this. There is room for fresh creations in that upper home of bliss. For the love of God is broader than the measures of our mind, and the heart of the eternal is most wonderfully but we make this love too narrow by false limits of our own, and we magnify its strictness with the zeal that God won't own. Tis not all we owe to Jesus, it is something more than all. Greater good because of evil, larger mercy through the fall. Make our love, O oh God, more faithful. Let us take you at your word, and our lives will be thanksgiving for the goodness of the Lord. I would like to invite the kids to join me for the children's message. Today in worship, we're talking about a movie called Just Mercy. And I bet you are wondering the same thing I am. What does mercy mean? Mercy could mean kindness or caring a very lot for someone or something. But I think love is the simplest definition of mercy. I found this 
God's love has no limits. I think that describes mercy pretty well. And you probably remember that over the last month, we've been doing a sermon series called Love in Action. This movie is an example of putting love into action because the main character is a man who moves to the Southern United States and cares very, very much. His love is what the movie is about. And you probably remember a few weeks ago when we did our chalk art show, you were invited to come to the church parking lot and draw pictures or write verses about love. It was for people of all ages. I would like to show you a video of our Love in Action chalk art show. God of mercy, help us to love one another with all our heart. Help us to love deeply, even when it is hard to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today we read from Psalm 146, verses 5 through 8. Happy are those whose help is the God of Jacob whose hope is in the Lord their God. Who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them. Who keeps faith forever. Who executes justice for the oppressed. Who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. 
we also read two parables from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, beginning with the first verse. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for the people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming in to him and saying, Grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. There's a point in Just Mercy where Brian Stevenson, the lawyer whose memoir of the same name provides the story of the movie, explains part of what motivates him. I came out of law school with grand ideas in my mind about how to change the world, but Mr. McMillan made me realize that we can't change the world with only ideas in our minds. We need conviction in our hearts. This man taught me how to stay hopeful because I now know that hopelessness is the enemy of justice. Hope allows us to push forward even when the truth is distorted by the people in power. It allows us to stand when they tell us to sit down and to speak when they say be quiet. Mr. McMillan is the other central character in our story. Walter McMillan, or Johnny D, as his family and friends call him, is arrested, tried, convicted, and sentenced to death for the 1987 murder of an 18-year-old woman in Alabama. Stevenson brought fresh hope to McMillan's case when he began representing McMillan during his appeal and clemency hearings. This hope propped up both the lawyer and the wrongfully convicted client at different times during the incredible journey chronicled in the movie. Some who are tuning into this message today have already watched the movie or read the book upon which it's based. For those who haven't yet had the chance, I hope you'll be inspired to do so. Here's the thing about this story. It's all too familiar. While there are deeply engaging moments in this narrative, I found it hard to be all that surprised by the details of Johnny D's wrongful arrest and race-based conviction. My guess is that you too will find an all-too-familiar refrain in how yet another man is victimized by a criminal justice system deeply tainted by systemic racism, historic poverty, and white privilege. I'm left to wonder how many stories like this have been told over the years? How many books have been written and read? How many movies have been made and watched? But where is the action? Where is the response 
is change ever going to come? Learning of the story of the falsely convicted Reuben Hurricane Carter, Bob Dylan sang in 1976, couldn't help but make me feel ashamed to live in a land where justice is a game. Changing how this game is played is exactly what Stevenson set out to do after he graduated from Harvard Law School in the mid-80s. Conscious that his own story was not all that different from the stories of the men he encountered on death row, sparked a response from Stevenson that was rooted in his upbringing and his faith in God. Stevenson, speaking to an audience of students at, the, at Seattle Pacific University in 2017, said, For young people of faith, believing things that we haven't seen, well, that defines who we are. Believing that we can create a community that is better at justice, better at equal treatment, better at overcoming racism and bigotry against the poor is essential. And then struggling to achieve those things that's the work. It sounds hard, but it's actually glorious. It's wondrous. It's energizing. It will make you feel privileged to have a purpose and that that purpose can be integrating what you believe in your heart with what you see and understand with your mind. That's an exciting way to live. This is my prayer for the church, that we see the pursuit of justice as a holy calling and as Stevenson puts it, an exciting way to live. As people of faith, we are responsible for the communities in which we have been placed by God. God expects us to care for these communities and to work relentlessly on behalf of our neighbors. The unfortunate and tragic death of George Floyd has brought this expectation into even sharper focus. For us who live here in the metro. But Floyd's death comes on the heels of Eric Garner and Tamir Rice and Philando Castile and Ahmad Arbery and Breonna Taylor and so many others. An important part of my prayer is that we might be roused from our complacency and make meaningful progress toward change. The stories told by the writers of the gospel were in part to accomplish something similar, to highlight injustice and inspire a faithful response. This is why we just heard these two parables from the Gospel of Luke. In the first, Jesus is describing the community of faith as a place where the search for justice needs to be as relentless as the widow who won't stop bringing her protests to the powerful. Then, in the second, Jesus draws an important distinction while describing how the faithful will seek out God's mercy. The religiously expert Pharisee lacks something the tax collector possesses, the knowledge that we all fall short. In God's eyes, we are the same. We are equally undeserving and yet equally loved. This is the scale of justice that God has created for the world. As a result, any time we attempt to define or order this world by its perceived differences, like the Pharisee, putting our thumb on the scale, we will only find ourselves humbled by the outcome. So we are called to ask ourselves, Will God find favor in how we have responded to the pleas for justice and mercy coming from our neighbors? I suspect this is a question that motivated Stevenson in his work with the incarcerated and the Equal Justice Institute. And his work can be lifted up as a faithful response to the deep injustices embedded in our country's criminal justice system as he reflected on the film and how it might be received by people of faith. Stevenson said, I hope it causes us to talk more about this need for redemption and grace to everyone. We can't be believers and be so hopeless about people who fall down. Life without parole is a hopeless sentence. 
and we impose that sentence on people who are drug addicted and drug dependent, people who have made poor choices around money, there has to be more hopefulness in the way we think about any person's ability to recover, to be redeemed. Then the second thing is that we need to see people of faith in spaces where there's a lot of despair and anguish, where there's a lot of trauma and abuse. I can't think of any place where that is more evident than in our jails and prisons. Just Mercy does a masterful job of highlighting the challenges facing this country and the performances by Michael B. Jordan as Stevenson and Jamie Foxx as Johnny D make their struggles personal and painfully authentic. Both are flawed heroes. Stevenson has to own up to his idealistic naivete and Johnny D's history is not without problem. But this is a good reminder that God's mercy isn't dependent on our past. At the same time, it can powerfully define our future. Of course, there is triumph experienced in the ultimate reversal of Johnny D's conviction and his subsequent freedom. Mercy comes, but I think the audience is left wondering whether it lives up to the film's title. Are those responsible for inflicting years of pain and suffering onto Macmillan and his family and his community held accountable? Of course not. And so the familiar story returns. Near the end of the movie, there's a scene where Stevenson and the freed Macmillan are invited to testify before a U.S. Senate hearing on the death penalty, where Stevenson describes what has been gained. Through this work, I've learned that each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done. That the opposite of poverty isn't wealth. The opposite of poverty is justice. That the character of our nation isn't reflected in how we treat the rich and the privileged, but how we treat the poor, the disfavored, and condemned. This should sound like familiar words for people of faith like us. Jesus was clear on what being in relationship with God calls for, and we need to keep these commands always before us. Yet it's amazing how often we continue to fall short. Again, speaking to the students of Seattle Pacific University, Stevenson says, we've gotten very hierarchical about mercy. We've gotten very conditional about mercy. We don't want to give people mercy unless they meet our conditions. That's not really mercy. Mercy is what you give to people who don't deserve it. Mercy is what you give to people who can't make the showing that you want them to make. You make that showing of mercy not just for them, but also for you. What I think mercy requires is that we understand human need and respond to it. So what are the needs around us this day? We know that our neighbors are hungry. We know that our neighbors are sick. We know that our neighbors are being victimized by historically unjust practices being propped up by a system too afraid to let go of the privileges it has possessed. Knowing and acknowledging these things is an important first step in making the changes God and our neighbors are asking of us. Stevenson says, it's easy to expect the worst part of you and just stay in that place because it takes work and faith and hope and belief and love to transcend some of the difficult and painful things that we do to one another. I think that's what we're called to do. And in that respect, the work can be both ministry and advocacy at the same time. Finally, I want to lift up the hope that this movie suggests is available for those willing to take on this work. 
I know that this hope holds the key to our response as a community of faith and as a people loved by God. Let's give Brian Stevenson the last word today. This past January, before the events of this tumultuous time took shape, Stevenson offered this to those preparing to watch and hopefully be moved by his story captured in this film. I do think there is something better waiting for us in this country. I do think there is something that feels more like freedom than inequality of justice. But to get there, we're going to have to talk more honestly. We're going to have to work harder. We're going to have to do the difficult things that are sometimes required to love mercy and to do justice and to walk humbly with God. Thanks be to God. Amen.
thank you for being with us today. We are grateful for your presence uh, and your participation in our community of faith. If you are tuning in to our worship service for the first time, uh, know that this uh, opportunity is our gift to you. We are grateful for your presence and your participation by viewing this is gift enough. If you are interested in supporting the work of our church and supporting the ongoing ministries of Prince of Peace Lutheran Church, we invite you to follow the link that you'll find in the video description where you can be taken to our online giving portal. So many members of this congregation and this community uh, make it a priority, and for that we are grateful. Your financial gifts to support the work that we are doing makes us continuing to be the church in this time and place possible, and we are so grateful for that. So this day, let's say a word of thanks and a prayer as we consider the offerings that come to support the work of God's church. Gracious God, we give you thanks for all that you have blessed us with. In this time and in this place, help us to use those gifts to do your work in the world, sharing your love with all of creation. In your name we pray. Amen. Let us join our hearts and our minds in prayer, trusting that God hears us. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks today for those who continue your work of justice in the world, for advocates and social workers, attorneys, judges, for writers and poets, agitators and protesters, for legislators and dreamers. Give us the energy to continue to work for justice in our corner of the world. Keep our eyes and hearts open to injustice, even when it hurts, so that we are not complicit in the pain of others, but are part of their healing and wholeness. Make us persistent like the widow, never giving up on the call for justice in the world. Lord, we pray for those who are tired, scared, lonely or frustrated. These are challenging times and we cling to your promise that you are with us. Surround us with your Holy Spirit. Remind us that you are as close to us as our very breath. We pray for courage, for Sabbath rest and renewal, and for your hope to guide us. All these things, gracious God, and whatever else you see that we need, we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our friend. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us pray together as our Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. As you serve one another communion, or if you are by yourself, hear these words being for you. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. We are all part of God's broader community, even as we worship separately through this interactive online format. Know that these words are for you and that all are welcome at the Lord's table.
now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you always in his peace. Amen. Well, my popcorn bowl is almost empty, and so uh, I just want to share a few words, uh, announcements with you. I'm grateful that you came and participated with us in worship today, and uh, we're grateful that uh, we could share this message with you. Uh, as uh, the, this community continues to go about uh, the work of the church, uh, a couple of things I want to draw to your attention. First, today, uh, this Sunday, July the 12th, at 11 o'clock, you have an opportunity to participate in a virtual real-time communion service. Pastor Betsy today will be leading uh, those who gather on Zoom at 11 a.m. And so look for the link in the video description or in your emails and uh, join in to be a part of that uh, communion service this day. This is something we'll continue once a month and the second Sunday of each month as we go forward. Secondly, Tonight at 6 o'clock, also Sunday, July 12th, um, the Affordable Housing Team is hosting the second of its informational potlucks and conversations. And so that happened just this past Wednesday and happening again this evening. And you are invited to come uh, with your potluck meal uh, that you'll share in spirit with one another, uh, but share in some good conversation and get updated on what the affordable housing team is up to. Again, that'll happen at six o'clock. Look for the link in the video description or uh, in our emails or on our website. Then this coming Thursday on July 16th, uh, we're gonna be uh, having the inaugural A Really Lazy Book Club, and uh, which is an, another way of saying, watch a movie and get together and talk about it. And this month we've been watching the movie that this service was based around, Just Mercy. Hopefully you've had a chance to watch it, and if not, you've got a few days now to, uh, to take that in, and then gather together with a group who wanna talk about it. Uh, or maybe you've read the book. That's another, uh, this Community of Faith did a, a book study on on this on the book Just Mercy uh, a little while ago. And so uh, be a part of the discussion now and see where uh, the work that Brian G Stevenson and the Equal Justice Institute has pulled together um, and, and see where that might be pushing and pulling our community uh, and how we might consider uh, the story of Walter McMillan and Brian Stevenson and how it was portrayed in the movie uh, and help that understand, help us come to understand our own stories and see where God might be calling us to go next as a result. So come and be a part of a really lazy book club this coming Thursday. Now, one last uh, little teaser. The next time that we will gather together in this format for a popcorn and movies service will be on Sunday, August the 2nd. Then we'll be featuring an animated feature called Coco. Uh, this is a great story and a wonderful story to, to watch together with your families. Um, but just because it's animated, don't think it's only for kids. It's a wonderful story uh, that... Um, gets us thinking a little bit differently about what it means to be family, what it means to consider our heritage, uh, and, uh, and fits in nicely with this summer movie series for us. So go look for Coco, and uh, we'll be posting links on where to find that movie and how you might be able to watch it. So uh, as your popcorn bowls are drained, probably uh, getting close to drained like mine, uh, I invite you to receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Put God's love into action. Thanks be to God.